Welcome to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider, where legal experts tear down contracts from some of the most well-known companies and high-profile executives around the world. In this episode, Arohi Kashyap walks us through the Salesforce data processing addendum. So let's tear it down. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider. I'm Mike Whalen. I am here with my friend Arohi Kashyap. Arohi, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Mike? I'm good. We are moving. It's 101 degrees outside in Kansas City right now, and it's supposed to rain. So it's just that like it's not quite ready to rain. So basically, I I have de-sweated myself so that I could come (laughs) and have this conversation with you about data processing agreements. I want to make a pivot to that, that people just sweat because of DPAs. But uh, I don't know. The transition is not quite as good. Uh, No, it works. It it works. (laughs) So speaking of, let me show the folks at home this document. This is uh, Salesforce's data processing addendum. Uh, what is this thing, Arohi? Um, well, a data processing agreement is basically a document that governs the relationship between a data processor who's you know, processing the data for somebody and, and getting to a goal that the data controller actually sets. So they have the data and they're giving it to the processor to do basically whatever they want with it. <laughs> okay, this is a show meant for lawyers. Most of you probably know more about this than I do. I am preparing myself to ask you very dumb questions about what any of that meant that you just said. But before we do that, let's ask about you. Arohi, what's your background? What brings you to documents like this? Um, So, yeah, I'm uh, a California and Indian lawyer. I have a practice in um, California and India, and our law firm spans for New York and New Jersey as well. Um, I also recently started a company with my partners called Legal Owls. We are a legal support company for other solo attorneys. So we help them expand their practice into areas like data privacy, immigration law, and stuff like that. Um, I get a lot of startups, and they are in tech and AI. So I help them with their data processing agreements, negotiating it, drafting it, getting the breach protocol set. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much how I get these agreements. Well, then that means you are ready for the dumb questions. So let's get to them. All right, so... I have a responsibility as a company owner to make sure that I keep things private. I have boxes, speaking of, of files, client files from like seven years Mm -hmm. ago that I'm still carrying around and probably will for the rest of forever because I'm so panicky about my responsibility to keep stuff private. Well, then I go use a tool like Salesforce or somebody else that's going to hold that data, if I'm understanding right, a data processing addendum is sort of an agreement between me and this provider that's also going to hold some of this data that I'm responsible for to make sure that they treat it as kindly as I would. Is that basically what a DPA is for? Yeah. So it's the person who gives the data and the person who then processes it for you. So it could always be that Salesforce has somebody else that they give your data to to process it in a particular way in which they need it. So in that case, you become the data subject. Salesforce would become the data controller. And then the other company that they've given it to would become the data processor. So, yeah, it it deals with all the data subjects rights, uh, what you can do with the data, how to keep it safe and secure, all of that. Yeah, that actually brings us to uh, something we wanted to talk talk about, which is the roles of the parties. So if I go down to uh, 2.1 in the main document, we're looking at uh, the roles of the parties. It says the parties acknowledge and agree that with regard to the processing of personal data, customer is a controller or processor, Salesforce mm-hmm. is a processor, and that Salesforce or members of the Salesforce group will engage sub-processors pursuant to the requirements set forth in, in 5. All right. A lot of words there. Uh, clearly, we think the word controller, processor, these subprocessor, these words mean something. Tell us about the relationships of the parties as they are defining them. Right. So the first thing that you have to know, and, and every attorney needs to do this when you're doing a DPA, is that you need to, and, and as they've done here in Salesforce, the Salesforce DPA, you need to clearly define who the party is and identify what their obligations are. So in this, Salesforce has said that their customer is the one who is having the control of the data. So the person who has control of the data and basically tells the service provider what to do with it. That's the data controller. So if you have the data and you're telling the service provider what to do, you're the data controller. You have all the control. You're the one who's going to be telling them what to do, what not to do. When it's given, the person it's given to, the service provider that it's given to, that's the data processor. They're going to be following whatever the data controller says. And they're going to be processing it in a way to basically achieve the goal that was given by the data controller. 
Subprocessors are often, and, and most companies who deal with um, a lot of data processing hire subprocessors who basically do what's in the agreement. So if the DPA is asking the data processor to do something, oftentimes the company themselves is not able to do a lot of it. So they're going to contract it out to data processors. So that's, that's basically what they're talking about. It's like if you have a company, they're having an independent contractor, and the independent contractor has a subcontractor. Well, it points out on that that the customer, it uses the word processor both under customer and under Salesforce. Both of them, you know, there's the word or right. for the customer. They could be a controller. They could be a processor. Salesforce is a processor. If I go to 2.2 and the customer's processing of personal data, it says that the customer shall, in the use of their services, process personal data in requirements in, conjun in line with the requirements of the data protection laws and regulations. And it, it, it talks about sort of the minimum kind of standards of care that the, right. the customer has to take care of personal data. What's that talking about? What does that tell you if the customer is the processor, their responsibility versus Salesforce? It sounds like Salesforce is kind of saying, bro, we didn't break your stuff. If you break it, it's on you. You bought it. Yeah. So the thing is, um, again, 2.2, I'm glad that you pointed it out because honestly, it is the most important clause that you have in any agreement. Now you have big companies and they can come in with their wonky agreements and they, they have dozens and dozens of agreements that they mandate the uh, sub data subjects to sign. So the, you, if you go on Salesforce and you see their legal documents, you'll see that they have dozens and dozens of agreements. It's, you can have the data processing agreement that refers you to five other documents and those five documents refer you to five other documents and the chain keeps going on. Um, why I specifically like this clause, and I think that this is a clause that all attorneys should look at when you're, you're drafting a DPA, is when you have a client who may be a startup or a new business or somebody who has significantly less bargaining power than their customer, the thing that it says in this agreement where they're putting the sole responsibility of all the accuracy, the quality, the legality, everything of the personal data on their customer, that's the part that's most important because in the law right now, when it comes to uh, data privacy, there are laws and legislations coming up every day in every country and in every state. We just recently saw that there was a Texas statute. I mean, everything is coming up. India also has something that's coming up uh, in like the next few months, probably. So what you have to do in such a situation is clearly define whose liability it is in what situation. So what process, what part of the agreement is whose responsibility. But more than that, you have to be, okay, you have to control the kind of data that is being processed. Um, why, again, I, I like this clause, especially for startups and, and new businesses when you're drafting DPAs for them, is oftentimes the limitation of liability in a data processing agreement starts and ends at the kind of data that's being processed. Now, if you have a company that maybe, you know, doesn't have the infrastructure to handle sensitive personal information, or they don't have the infrastructure to handle financial information or healthcare information, you need to put that in your DPA. And the way that you would put it in your DPA is through disclaimers and through clauses like this, where you put the liability on the controller. So you tell the controller that, listen, we're not going to have any of this. We don't know how to handle healthcare information. We are not going to be handling financial information. You cannot give that stuff to us. And you put the liability on them because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are controlling the kind of data that you get. And it's, it's not practical to assume that you're going to be sifting through and seeing every data that may come up in a chatbot. I mean, if you have a chatbot as your main software, you don't know what everyone's going to write. You'll have it. It'll be there in your systems but you don't know what everyone's going to write. And if the company presents to their client that, hey, you know what, why don't you put your social security numbers inside? Or why don't you put your health records inside? That's going to be a problem. So using a clause like this to restrict your liability, Salesforce has done that brilliantly here. So they've said that, you know what, in no way are we going to be a data controller. We have no responsibility of a data controller. Even if you're a processor and you actually have a data controller that you have to answer to, or your data subjects are actually your data controllers, we still do not have that responsibility. You see your responsibility. We maintain our responsibility as a data processor and nothing more. Yeah, there's quite a bit in here going down through the relationship to Salesforce. And, and again, they're mm -hmm. just really underlying who they are versus who the subprocessors are and some of the, the security requirements and who's right. got audits and all that. We had a previous conversation with Abishai uh, Ostrin that uh, I would send people to to dig into all that. But I, I want to talk about getting in trouble. Um, you know, 
you can try to take care of this. You, you, you can follow all the rules. Uh, the, you're fighting a war right now. Incidents happen. Things happen. Uh, there's a bit in 7 about customer data incident management and notification about, hey, if something happens, here's how we're going to tell people. Here's what you have to do. Here's what we have to do. But I, I, we talked about this before. I, I, there's quite a bit of those details. If something happens, what's the process that's outside this document? Talk to me about mm -hmm. that. Talk, talk about where we find what happens when things go wrong. Right. So those are the data breach protocols. And any company that deals with data needs to have these in place. Now, the problem is that a lot of processors and controllers, basically anyone who has data, you're often get very overconfident. You think, oh, you know what? We have it down packed. We have our security systems. We're great. We're not going to have a data breach. Come on, that doesn't happen to people like us. You're going to assume that that's there. However, you never know, OK? It is very common to have data breaches. And data breach doesn't mean that your entire system gets hacked. Even the smallest data being released in a manner that it wasn't supposed to be is a data breach. So it is. What what I have encountered several times with with several clients is that when they are a startup and a startup, I, I need everyone to realize that doesn't mean a small little company that's working out of their parents garage. That means that you are a company that is dealing in tech. You recently started and these days tech companies that are starting up get hundreds in, of millions of dollars in investments. So they have a lot of money, but their protocols really aren't catching up to the speed in which they want to grow. So what needs to be understood is that when you're signing an agreement, so either you give your own draft. So the, the, most, the, the best thing to do is for data processors to have their own DPA and give that to their customers to sign. However, oftentimes customers are going to be like, no, we want you to sign our DPA and you're not going to, you're not going to give us your own DPA. We have a standard one. According to our policy, you need to sign that. Now, in situations like that, what you need to be sure about is the kind of data breach protocols they've put in place. A lot of times controllers are going to try to put that breach responsibility and, and protocol responsibility on the processor and not take it on themselves. Through law and by law, the processor's responsibility starts and ends at a timely notification to the data controller and providing them with necessary information about the breach. That's pretty much what the data processor's, uh, processor's sort of responsibility is. The controllers are supposed to then inform the data subjects and handle it that way. Now, the problem is that a lot of clients trying to be, you know, good people and, and have good business practices and ethical business practices, they're going to put into the agreement that, you know what, we're going to help you out during the data breach. We're going to help you sort it out. We'll help you tell the data subjects about what's going on. Don't worry. We got it. We'll help you out. You want to do that? Great. Please go ahead. I would be happy for you to do that. I would love to help people do that as well. But don't put it in agreement. Because if that's in an agreement that you're helping somebody out when it's not your responsibility, tomorrow the data controller can put that liability on you and you don't want that happening. They, you don't know where all they've gotten their data from. You have the data. You don't know who all the data subjects were. You don't know where all the controller got that data from. So you don't want to take the responsibility of having to go and help them with their data breach protocols. And it is a very expensive process. So you're getting, there's a lot of time and money and I mean, a lot of things that you have to sort of take into account when you start clicking in your data breach protocols and when that's triggered and data controllers start doing that. So, I mean, in short, keep your liability to the extent that it is only required by law. If the law only requires processors responsibility to start and end at you notifying the controller and you giving them information about the breach, keep it there. Later on, you want to help them, go ahead. But in the agreement, don't write that you'll be helping them out. Speaking of liability, there's presumably in these situations, everybody trying to point the finger at everybody else. They weren't prepared for this. Everybody thought they were okay. And now there's trouble. I want to jump to 5.4 specifically. Salesforce mm -hmm. shall be liable for the acts and omissions of its subprocessors to the same extent Salesforce would be liable if performing the services of each subprocessor directly under the terms of this DPA. Right. This is a pretty aggressive affirmative ownership of liability, but I'm not sure that the rest of the document really reflects Salesforce taking much responsibility anyway. Like for Salesforce to take the amount of uh, responsibility as if it was them, they're not taking a ton anyway. What do you think about the way they're sort of allocating liability in case something goes wrong in this document? 
So in this document specifically, when and when you have subprocessors, um, a lot of data uh, le data protection legislations and everything require the data processor to sort of take on that liability, and be like, you know what, um, if the subprocessor is doing something, we're liable to the extent that we're liable here. The problem comes in, and and I think that this is a pretty standard um, line to have and a standard template to have in in agreement. The problem come, comes is when you try to overextend or you don't properly draft the liabilities of a subprocessor and you as a data processor in conjunction with the subprocessor. A lot of people, what they'll do is they'll see, they'll write uh, terms like um, the data processor shall be responsible for all acts of the subprocessor. And this is this is not me talking, you know, just like, you know, it's in my head. I've actually seen clauses where they've written things like, you know, we'll be responsible for all the acts of the subprocessor, or we're responsible for all processing done by the subprocessor. Now, you can't write that because technically, if you are given bad information, okay, so if suppose the data processor is given illegal information or sensitive personal information by the data controller, and they go ahead and they give it to the data processor, the data processor processes it and, and they do everything that they want. And again, you find out that there is medical information being processed. Now you can have um, liability protection for the data processor within your agreement. But if you don't extend that kind of liability protection to the data, uh, to the subprocessor, that's where they can catch you. So you don't want to be responsible for, and you don't want to be responsible for everything the subprocessor does. You want to be responsible for to the extent that you are within the agreement, but you don't want to increase it beyond that. So you do have to be responsible. There are a few caveats that you can put in, and Salesforce has put it in throughout the other numerous documents that you'll see on their site. And they've in certain areas written that, you know, if the, and, and a lot of people do this, that if the subprocessor does anything outside the scope of the relationship, or if the subprocessor does anything illegal or anything like that, that's that's on the subprocessor and that's not on them. And that works because they have a lot of transparency with who the subprocessor is with the data controller. So like if the data controller doesn't like the subprocessor, there are caveats for that. If you want to change the subprocessor, uh, the data controller doesn't really like them, you, you can go ahead and do that. And there are caveats for that as well. But in situations like this, the importance of your agreement with your subprocessor increases exponentially because you don't have complete control over what they're doing, but you're completely liable for what they're doing. So in short, if I were to talk to about a clause like this, it's standard and, and a lot of clauses have this, but you just sort of have to have some additional protection that is woven into the agreement. Uh, but the most important thing that this would lead to is the agreement that you have with your subprocessors. So as a data processor, you have to put in all the caveats that, that give you indemnity, that give you liability protection, all of the good stuff. So you put that into your um, agreement with the subprocessor. I want to go back to your point about startups. One of the things that has surprised me as, I'm talking, as, I, as I've been talking to so many in-house attorneys is how large companies are that don't mm -hmm. have an attorney, right? That don't have somebody in-house. And, you know, to your point, I mean, these are multi-hundred million dollar companies that have pretty slim legal protections, uh, you know, unless they started in a certain industry, healthcare, and, and they were like really aware of data issues if you're in healthcare or legal or something like that. But for a lot of these companies that are handling potentially sensitive data, they're not actually doing that much. To your point, they're, they're saying, oh, no, we're good. We've got those documents. We paid our outside counsel to create those documents. We're good. And then these things happen. Give me sort of a, an overview, sort of a take home. If you're in this startup environment, which, to, again, is not a tiny company necessarily, mm -hmm. but if you're in this kind of environment where you're moving fast and breaking things, as they say, you're, you're trying to create on the fly, you're trying to, to slow down and deal with data agreements like this. Tell me, give me a, a take home message for that group. I think the most important thing is for lawyers to realize that you have to look at it in two aspects and not just the legal aspect. You have to look at the legal aspect, which we all know. We know that you have to protect your client, you have to do risk management, you have to decrease their liability, and you have to ensure that there's compliance to law. We all know that, that that's what has to happen with any agreement. But when you're dealing with startups and when you're dealing with companies that firstly have very little bargaining power, but also companies that are only looking to go and get more and more customers, you have to think of the business aspect of it. When drafting a DPA for a processor, you have to make sure that you know who your client is, how big and influential your client may be, and who their customer is. 
you have to see how much bargaining power and how much negotiating power you have and draft it accordingly. When it's a startup and they're getting all of this money and, and they're moving fast and they see people wanting their product and they're coming up with products every day and, and they're launching all of those things, you have to know that they're going to do anything to sign that agreement and to get it moving. So you have to know that they are not going to want to listen to you if you're creating a substantial barrier for them getting a customer. And that's something that I'm sure every law attorney can relate to. So what you want to do is with the DPA, you make it simple, concise, clear, and you protect your client in as minimal words as you can. If you want to add addendums, go ahead. But again, don't do too many. You maybe have an addendum for a data breach protocol. A lot of people have addendums and it's a good practice to have it for maybe the any processing that's happening in the European Union. Uh, but other than that, you want to make it so that your DPA is as simple, concise and, and clear as possible. Complete transparency. Don't try to hide anything and just make it very simple because otherwise the other party, your client's customer is not going to want to sign that agreement. And they're going to say that, you know what, we'll give you our agreement. Your client is only going to want to sign the agreement because they're looking where to get their next customers from. They're going to stop caring about what you're saying and you don't want that happening. So if you want your customers to, if you want your clients to listen and you want them to follow what you're saying, you have to think of the business aspect of it. You think of it in, in, a, in the mind of an entrepreneur. What are they going to do and how far are they going to listen to you and how far are they going to let you stop their business before they just ignore what you're saying? So I think that's that's a take home message. Yeah, it's good advice. And it, it feels like this feels like the perfect context for that story of nobody cares about the fire until they see the smoke. Right. And yeah. and so this is the place where lawyers add the most value, but might be the hardest to see that value and to justify it. So it's difficult, but important. I appreciate you adding that perspective. Uh, Arohi, for people who want to learn more about you and your company, what's the best way to connect with you? So yeah, um, I you can connect with me on my email address. It's uh, Arohi A R O H I at uh, Kashyap Partners K A S H Y A P P A R T N E R S dot com, or you can get me on LinkedIn and send me a message. I'd be more than happy to chat. Perfect. We'll make sure there are links to that over at lawinsider.com slash resources, as well as this agreement in the video and podcast for this. So go check that out there. Uh, also, if you want to be a guest on the Contract Teardown Show to beat up contracts as we are wont to do, just email us. We're at community at lawinsider.com. Arohi, thank you. All of you, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.